one of the biggest surprises in the Star Wars prequels comes in the droid factory scene in Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, where R2-D2 suddenly deploys rocket boosters from his shoulders and takes flight. R2's inability to use this feature in later episodes is explained as canon simply by stating that by the time of Episode 4, A New Hope, the boosters had stopped working and R2 was out of warranty. Think of all the places that the ability to fly would have come in handy in the later films. On Tatooine, R2 could have conducted an aerial search for Obi-Wan Kenobi. R2 could have also easily escaped the Jawas by flying away. On the ice planet Hoth, R2 could have searched for Luke by air, saving Han and Luke from spending the night inside a Tauntaun. On Dagobah, R2 could have flown over the swamp instead of falling in. On Jabba the Hutt's sand barge, R2 could have carried Luke's lightsaber right to him. And he also could have flown off the sand barge instead of diving into a sand dune. There are countless places where the ability to fly could have come in handy, but is it really possible for an R2 unit to fly in the first place? Some people have even done the calculations to see if it is even possible. But there is some evidence to show that R2 units can fly, because for over 40 years, there have been commercially available model rockets patterned after R2-D2. But upon closer inspection, it's obvious that certain liberties were taken with the rocket models to make them inexpensive and flight-worthy. We really wanted to know if a rocket-powered R2 unit would actually fly, so we took our Star Wars-inspired C2-B5 3D printed droid model and modified it to accept the water rocket and parachute recovery system based on our experience with building advanced water rockets. Our plan was to launch the model and see what would happen. Let's see how it went. The first thing that we needed to do was to assemble a parachute for our droid. We did a video a while ago showing an easy method to make parachutes using plastic table coverings. In this case, silver seemed like the appropriate color choice. The next modification was to remove the central leg assembly from our droid and replace the lower skirt with a new version designed to hold a water rocket bottle. The retaining ring for the head dome was also replaced with a version that would hold the water rocket bottle, as well as a parachute. A parachute line was glued to the inside of the dome, and the main parachute line was connected to the neck of the droid. The parachute was then carefully folded and placed on the top of the droid under the dome. The recovery system employed here is called the Nose Off at Apogee system. This is a passive deploy system that uses momentum and gravity to release the parachute when the rocket turns over at Apogee. We have designed several timer and altimeter servo-triggered electronic deploy systems in the past, but our calculations show that this rocket would only go about 100 feet high, and that would not provide adequate time for a servo-based system to activate safely. Our droid is now fully prepped and ready to launch. We set up our portable launcher, which uses a unique split-collar retaining mechanism to hold all manner of water rockets securely while being pressurized, which we featured in one of our previous videos. After filling the water rocket booster with one-third water, we placed it on the launcher and began to pressurize the rocket. Once we reached the launch pressure of 110 psi, we crossed our fingers and pulled the release cord. Well, that didn't go exactly the way we had hoped. The damage was not actually as severe as this wreckage appears. The only broken part was the left leg and foot. The rest of the pieces are snap-on parts, which simply popped off and were otherwise undamaged. It is clear from the launch that the droid didn't go high enough for the parachute to inflate before hitting the ground. In our next launch attempt, we would use more pressure to get more altitude. 
So a new leg and foot were printed. Then we painted the leg and foot. And assemble the parts. Then prepare it for a second launch. This time we decided to launch the rocket over water so a crash landing like the first launch would not be so hard. To get more altitude for this launch, we began to fill the rocket with 120 psi of air pressure. Well that was unexpected. Apparently, these small bottles fail at 120 PSI. Lucky for us, the dome simply blew off and allowed the explosion to escape without hurting the droid at all. We simply could reattach the dome and try again. Pressurizing again to 110 PSI, we prepared for the third launch attempt. The third time's a charm, right? <laughs> this droid must be cursed. He refuses to cooperate. Fortunately, in the past we have created a device for getting rockets and drones out of tall trees, which we have featured in a past video. We used our tree rescue device to recover the droid from the tree. It was apparent from the previous launch that the wind really helped deploy the parachute quicker, so launching at a lower pressure would go a little less high, but it would land the droid before it could blow into the trees. We tried the next launch at 90 psi. Finally, we have success. We have just shown that an R2 unit can actually fly successfully with water rocket power. After all that abuse, our droid is still in great condition. We removed the rocket components and reverted him back to a static model. With that success, we proved that an R2 unit can indeed fly and wonder where we should go next. What do you think? Should we add an electronic deploy system? Or how about a reinforced pressure vessel to ramp up the pressure and altitude? What suggestions do you have for the next steps? Leave your ideas in the comments below and tell us what you want to see. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel to see more projects like this and give us a like if you enjoy these types of videos. That's all for now. We'll see you next time, and may the Force be with you.